Amen. It is a wonderful privilege to be in the house of God. Turn your Bibles with me to Revelation, uh, the 11th chapter, and we take it from verse 14. Yes, I'm correct. We take it from verse 14. I should tell you that the verses are many, and it's not even possible for us to go through them, but we will enjoy one or two of the verses, then we'll come down to the crooks of the matter. We read together, please, for emphasis. I heard it was read already. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and the twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast, and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and hast reigned. Verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them, which destroy the earth. Verse 19, and it's verse 19 that I'm really going to pitch my tent. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake. And the great hail. The title of my message is The Ark of His Covenant. Or the Ark of His Testament. The Ark of His Covenant. I prefer Covenant, actually. Uh, I, I prefer Covenant. I know it's the same meaning, the same words. I like Covenant. The Ark of His Covenant. Let us pray. Oh Lord, my God and our Savior, we ask, Lord, that you will speak a word to our hearts. Oh Lord, in times like these, we need to hear from you. We ask, Lord, that you'll give us a word of hope, a word of encouragement, a word of consolation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. The book of Revelation is a very intriguing book but when it comes on to the saints of the last days the book of revelation is that book that all of us if we will survive 
The events that are even now unfolding before our eyes, we need to get in the book. In fact, I would go so far as saying that you can't really be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and not know Revelation and Daniel. It's almost an impossibility. Because our theology and our church is intricately wrapped up in these books and around them. Of course, Ellen White, our prophet, writes that every last day Christian should live in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Revelation concludes Earth's history in the midst of great calamities and disasters. Revelation chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11. Indeed, from chapter 7 on to 11, we find great apocalyptic events unfolding. Events most awesome and most terrible. But the last of these trumpets, as the trumpets sound one after the other, and the seven trumpets unfold, revealing cataclysmic history in earth's events. The last three trumpets are called the war trumpets. We find a mighty angel come down from heaven, and before the blowing of the last three trumpets, and the final trumpet will usher in the coming of the Lord. And the angel, before the trumpets were blown, the angel fly over the entire world, crying, Whoa! 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 Over and over again, the messenger of God from heaven pronounces war upon the inhabitants of the earth. And when asked, why war? He said, war because of what is going to happen under the last three trumpets. Our texts take us to the final war. The most deadly of them all. And I should tell you, brethren, that we are living in the days of the seventh angel. The second woe is past. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And without going into fulfillment of prophecy, we will leave that for a prophecy exposition or something. But we will tell you this one thing, that the seventh angel has already begun to sound. Our pioneers dwelt a lot on the beginning of the sounding of the seventh angel. But the Bible said, when the seventh angel sounded, there were voices in heaven. And notice that it's in heaven that these things are happening. Heaven is understanding what people on earth cannot see. But things are unfolding in heaven. Things that on earth we cannot see. We are in the events and we can't see the war. We are walking up and down in a time of living crisis when apocalyptic events is unfolding and Christ is about to come and we see it not. The devil and his horse is at war. All hell is let loose and we think it's peace and safety. But when they shall cry peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them like a woman in travail. Whoa! But in heaven, angels and unfallen intelligences look down upon humanity and they cry out. The kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Will you say amen out there? You know, people ask me all the time, why doesn't God do something? 
They say there is so much wickedness happening. Why doesn't God do something? If I were God, I would move upon the wicked. Well, I'm here to tell you today that God has already done something. And God is already operating in heaven. The kingdoms of this world. And incidentally, I should tell you that among the things that God is about to do, God is about to take over the control of the earth. <laughs> He's about to get rid of prime ministers and presidents and kings. And all the countries of the world are about to become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, oh, I wish we had time to go into them, uh, which sat before God on their seats, fell on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, We thank thee, Lord God Almighty, which art, which was, and which art to come, because you have taken to you your great power, and has reigned. You know, these 24 elders, for centuries, they have been wondering why doesn't God exert some power on earth? They saw wicked men persecuting good men and good men dying. And they wondered why doesn't God show his power? They were waiting in anticipation for the power of God to be manifested. But God waits patiently and patiently because the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. But he's long suffering to a sword. And so though evil men reign and God could block them out with the twinkling of an eye. Yet God waits. But the weight of God is not forever. And when the seventh angel sounded, suddenly God decided to move. No longer pleading with people to repent. God is done with that. No longer preaching and teaching people. He's finished with that. Now God decides that it's time for me to use power. The Almighty suddenly decided to use might. He tried love a long time, mercy for centuries, and now it's time for God to move in. And I can assure you something, that these events are about to be fulfilled before our very eyes. In fact, the Bible tells us the exact time when these events will take place. Uh, look at verse 18. It said, and the nations were angry. It said, when God is about to put in his power, it will be a time when the nations were angry. And thy wrath is come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets. And to them that fear thy name, small and great and should this destroy them which destroy the earth. Come on, brethren, and say amen. The Bible said that Christ will come to give reward to his saints and to punish the wicked. And the Bible said he will do it at a time when the nations are angry. And they have the potential, the weapons, the arsenal to destroy the earth. But the last part of that verse says that Christ will come and destroy them which destroy the earth. And incidentally, I should tell some of you, because maybe you're nervous that with all of the intercontinental ballistic missiles and hydrogen bombs that are stockpiled, perhaps you're scared that, that, that Russia and America or China or one of these countries will destroy the earth. But I want to tell you something, that God has reserved the destruction of planet earth for himself. <laughs> Dr. Aral Dure, one of the developers of these atomic bombs, said a flaming end seems inevitable. He said someday there will be at the head of a government somebody crazy enough to unleash this bomb. And when it happens, it will be nuclear holocaust. He said the bomb is so powerful that if we release them, the entire world will be destroyed. It doesn't even matter, he said, who fire first. Everybody will die. Well, I want to tell you something that I don't know what gets into 
you were ahead. But when it comes on to the destruction of the world, it's not in the hands of man. It's in the hands of God himself. And I want to assure you right now that America, with all of its nuclear armament and technology, cannot destroy this earth. Russia, with all of the bombs I hear stockpiling upon one another. I read in Newsweek magazine that they have so many nuclear bombs that they could destroy this earth and rebuild it 100 times over. Can you imagine that? So much bombs that if they unleash them, it could destroy the earth 100 times. I said to myself, man, that's overkill. <laughs> But Russia cannot destroy this earth. My ladies and gentlemen and my beloved brethren, whenever the earth is destroyed, the Bible said Christ will come. And the Bible said when he comes, he's going to destroy them which destroy the earth. Will you say amen out there? Yeah, and all of that just brings me to my text. <laughs> All of that was just preamble to tell you the truth. Here's my text now. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and the thunderings and an earthquake and the great hail. In the midst of all of this crisis and in the midst of last day events when, when the dragon and the beast and, and all the enemies of God congregate together and wicked men plotting to destroy righteous people and planning to destroy the earth. The Bible said in the midst of all of that while it's going on, suddenly John looked and John saw the temple of God opened in heaven. There was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. I decided to talk to you about that because we need to know exactly what our relationship to God should be in the last days. I thank God that you come to the church here on earth, this marvelous, covenous edifice that we have here. And, and I'm impressed by the fact that we come and worship day after day. But I want you to understand that in the midst of the crisis that is going on, your eyes, the Bible said, when these things begin to come to pass, Jesus said, lift up your heads and look up. And when you look up, what will you see? You must see the temple of God opened in heaven. There was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. We might lie to you a little bit because probably you don't know. So probably we have not been absolutely truthful to you. Because we have a sign up here, Mark. Reverence my sanctuary. And we didn't explain the sign, so it's there. And some of you might think that the reverence my sanctuary referred to you that you should act nice in this building. But that's not what that is about. This is not a sanctuary. And the sanctuary you are called to reverence is not this building. This is just a huge auditorium where we gather to worship. <laughs> but the sanctuary of God is in heaven. And the reverence that is inspired to an earth must be because our minds, our eyes, and our conversation is in the sanctuary in heaven. And as we come here, our job is to look beyond this building and beyond these people and to see the sanctuary in heaven open up. And there was seen in his sanctuary, in his temple, the ark of his covenant. I want to suggest to you, brethren, that in the last days, as things get worse upon us, there are seventy Adventists, that our job is to look at the sanctuary of God. Our job is not to look around us, because when you look around, there is just discouragement. And you look around, there is nothing to encourage you. But if you look to the sanctuary of God, you will see the ark of his testament. And as if that was not enough, John said there were voices, thunderings, an earthquake, 
and great hail. Why did God, what purpose could the Holy Spirit have to ask us to look at the temple and see the Ark of Covenant? What does that have to do with the trials of the last day? Why is it that our saints in the last day must bear in mind and see at all times this Ark of Covenant? And the temple of God was open. You know, it's interesting that the temple was opened in heaven because the temple was opened all the time. When Jesus died, one of the great phenomenon that occurred when Jesus died, the Bible said the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. The veil that separates the holy from the most holy. And when the veil was rent, everybody could look upon the ark of his covenant. But now in the last day, as cataclysmic events are about to be unleashed, as the war of God is about to be poured out upon the earth, as the seven last plagues are about to be poured out, and earth is about to be destroyed, and divine judgment is about to be unleashed, suddenly God said, look up, look at the ark. The ark of his testament. What is this ark? Let's talk about the ark for a little bit. The ark of covenant. What did John see when he saw the ark? What is it that God wants us to see while he's pointing us to the ark of his testament, the ark of his covenant? Well, I would suggest to you this ark, you, you know the ark. It was made of, the, of shitty wood. The unrotten wood of the acacia tree, overlaid with gold, giving it the appearance of gold. The ark was there, and, and, and the, the covering of the ark was made of one solid piece of beaten gold called the mercy seat. Surmounting either side of this ark were two golden cherubims with their faces turned towards each other, looking down on the mercy seat. Inside the ark were, were the Ten Commandments, the law of God. Aaron's rod that budded was placed there also, and the pot of manna was placed in the ark. And, and this basically was what enveloped the ark. But at the dedication of the temple, the China glory of God, the, the China glory of God, the, the symbol of God's visible presence came and hoovered above the ark. So the ark was the place where God lived. The ark was symbolic of the very throne of God. It was the place where God sits and govern and judge. That's why David said God sitteth between in the cherubim and the Bible said that in the last days when all hell breaks loose you must lift up your head and look at heaven look in the very throne room of God and see God sitting there on the ark of the covenant will you say amen out there what is it that God wants you to see well the first thing I think God wants you to see is this covenant I think God wants you to get an idea that he has a covenant with man. Will you say amen out there? You know, I went to a church to preach, and uh, I preached there a few times. But I'll never forget the first time I went there. I, I remember Brother Bobby came to me. He's the chief bishop. Came to me, and, and he said, you know what we call our church, pastor? I said, what do you call your church? He said, this is the Covenant City Church. And I got excited. I said, say it again. He said, it's the Covenant City Church. And I said, hallelujah. He said, but wait, it looks like you're out to get in a spirit. <laughs> I, said, I said, to tell you the truth, I was in spirit just a while ago. But I, tell him, I said to him, I like that. I said, what do you call it? He said, Covenant City Church. I said, man, then this is my church. He said, why? I said, because I'm Adventist. And as Adventists, we live on the Covenant. <laughs> I said, we'll stay with the covenant. And so I said to him, you know what? I'm going to preach on the covenant because you guys love the covenant. And I said to him, I'm a covenant man myself because God has made a covenant with his people. Will you say amen out there? And I came here to tell you that when things are going bad, all you have to do is remember the covenant you made with God. Covenant. What is a covenant? A covenant is a contract. Basically, in the most 
simple form, it's an agreement. Contract that is mutually binding upon both parties. And God, in order to govern us aright, God didn't just make promises, but God came down here and God strike a covenant with humanity. God has a contract with us, a contract that God must fulfill. Will you say amen out there? And I want you to understand that when the devil comes into your life, you need to look up to heaven and see the covenant you have with God and know that you are in business with Jesus. Will you say amen out there? But what did John see? What is in this covenant, this contract that God make with us? Well, I think the first thing John saw was God dwelling with his people. The first thing John saw was what? God dwelling with his people. Because God said to Moses in Exodus 25 and verse 8, he said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may live, dwell among them. And so the tenth sanctuary was built. And in the innermost shrine of the sanctuary was this ark of covenant. And on top of the ark, God lives. And the ark symbolized God living with us. Will you say amen out there? I don't know what you're going through, but I came here to tell you that as long as you're a child of God, you have God himself living with you. It is part of God's covenant. And as I said to the couple, the, the friends that I I spoke to a while ago. You don't have to be afraid of gunmen. You don't have to be afraid of thieves because God living with you is a part of the covenant. And I want to tell you something that you are not alone even in this building. You must watch your step, watch your talk, watch your conversation, watch how you think because there is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place and I know that it's the presence of the Lord. God dwelling with man. You saw the ark of his covenant. What did John see? Well, John saw the Chikina glory representing God living with man. But then John couldn't help but see two golden cherubims on either side of the ark. Will you say amen out there? Two angels with their faces turned towards each other and one wing stretched out upon an eye to form a heart or a canopy over the Chikina glory and the other wing folded around its body looking down on the mercy seat. John saw two angels. Can I tell you that the covenant that you have with God, the agreement you make with God when you get baptized, not only have God living with you, but God put angels as part of the covenant. Will you say amen out there? I want you to understand that God said, I will come and live with you. And Lord, I am with you always. But not only God said, I'm going to be there, but God said, I am putting angels as a part of the covenant. I'm putting angels in the deal. So when the devil comes upon your heart and when the enemy comes in your life then I came here to tell you that the angels of God encamp it round about them that fear him and he delivers them because angels are part of the covenant or oh, touch somebody beside you and tell them I have angels as a part of the covenant touch somebody else and tell them I have angels as part of the covenant Oh, glory, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but sometimes even when I'm walking, it's as though I can sense the divine angels walk with me. And so I can sing, he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and he has angels as part of the covenant. As we look up in the last day, not only do we see the presence of God enough with us and angels as part of the covenant. But what else does John see? Well, the lid is called the mercy seat. Because mercy is part of the covenant. <laughs> you, you know, um, God knew even before you mess up, that you would mess up. God knew before you fall that you would fall. 
God knew when he called you that your condition would get rough. And that you would get discouraged because you would say, Lord, I'll try me, I'll try, look how me stay bad. So God said, you know what? I'm going to put mercy as part of the covenant. <laughs> so I came here to tell somebody that it doesn't matter what you have done, how dirty you are, where you have been. I came here to tell you that if you have a covenant with God, mercy is a part of the covenant. I came here to tell you that you can come to my God. You can plead with him. My God will forgive you. He will have mercy and he will restore you. Because mercy is a part of the covenant. Look up. And see the ark of his covenant and learn that mercy. And it wasn't easy to get mercy, but we get it anyhow. God told Bezalel and the holy ab that in order for mercy to come, God said to them, get all the gold you can. Melt it together into one huge block and then use hammer and beat the block of gold until it's flat. Don't use any tool upon it. Just beat it and beat it. And so they took this gold and for days they beat it and beat it until it was thin and flat. And then God said, put it on the covenant as a covering. And they put it and God said, that's the mercy seat. Will you say amen out there? Mercy, because for us to get mercy, the golden boy, Jesus, the golden one, has to be beaten and beaten and beaten. He had to tread the white press alone and receive all the blows that you should have gotten. Jesus, take them for you and so he can have mercy. When the law, when you mess up and the, the judgment of God is about to fall upon you and the judgment is about to take you, Jesus spread forth himself and took the beating and then said, have mercy on him. I have already taken the lashing. Mercy. Yes. You should have died too. You should have suffered. Yes, you should have gone to hell. But Jesus paid it all. Christ went through it. And now mercy is a part of the covenant. Lord said we should look up. What uh, will we see if we look up and see the ark of his covenant? Well, inside the ark, there were the Ten Commandments, law of God. I know some of you might not like to hear that, but I should tell you, that commandment keeping a part of the covenant. <laughs> I was talking to my pastor from the Sunday church and he said, man, I wish I could take out that one. Well, you can't take it out. It's a part of the covenant. <laughs> so that when you come to God, he expects you to live up to the commandments of God. But somebody said, but pastor, what going to happen to me if I mess up? Well, I'll tell you this. That if you mess up with the commandment, you have no problem. Because mercy is part of the covenant. <laughs> and you see, God so made the covenant. That God said, put mercy here. Then put the angels on either side of mercy. And have the angels looking down on mercy. Have God above mercy sitting on mercy. But between God and the commandments, there is mercy. So that God can only look at the commandments through mercy. Before God even see the law, God see mercy. So when God look at you, God say, oh, it's a good thing, I already have mercy. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Before the Lord even view the Lord, the Lord said, ah, it's a good thing I get mercy before I come to this law, so I can have mercy. <laughs> a part of the covenant. What else did John see? I didn't intend to talk so long, and I intended to the two words. I wrap up quick. What else did John see? Well, inside the ark, there was a pot of manna. The pot of manna. Ah, you remember that for 40 years, Israel ate manna. God fed them. They didn't have to do anything for the food. It was just there. 
Every morning, it would just fall in the night, and they'd just go up and pick up food. They didn't have to work for it. They didn't even have to pray for it. They didn't have to ask God for it. God just give it to them. That, that's how great God is. He just give it. You don't have to ask him or anything. He just give the food. But when they were about to go into the promised land, suddenly, God called Moses and Aaron. God said to Moses, manna is going to stop. But I want you to, to do this one last thing. I want you to take up some manna and put it in a pot. When he did that, put the manna in the pot. He said, Lord, what should I do with this pot of food? God said, put it in the covenant. <laughs> I don't care who you are, where you come from, and I don't even know what your condition is. It doesn't really matter to me. But I can tell you this. If you're in covenant relationship with my God, then I come here to tell you that food is a part of the covenant. Yes, it is. In fact, it was so much a part of the covenant that God said to Moses, and Moses said to the people, tell the people. Because God lived in the canvas city, in the center of Israel. He said, tell the people that all they have to do is to look towards my house, to the temple. And all they have to do is just ask. Well, Lord, what shall they ask? They must just ask, Lord, Give us this day our daily bread. Really say him out there. <laughs> you see, Israel understood that even if you didn't have any food in your house and you didn't have any in the cupboard and the fridge is empty, they knew that God had food. God, food is part of the covenant. Yes, give us this day our daily bread. And Jesus even adopted it in the Lord's prayer. But, 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 but. A friend of mine come to me once and he said, Clark, the problem is not the daily bread. I said, then what is the problem? And this happened years ago. And he said to me, the problem is the monthly bread. <laughs> oh, he missed it, so I have to tell him. He said, the problem is not the daily bread, it's the monthly bread. So I said to him, what do you mean by the monthly bread? He said, well, you see, I am not impressed to go to God to ask for daily bread. What I want is my cupboard full. So I'm going to have to come back for the month. <laughs> he said, the daily bread makes you sound like you're too poor. <laughs> he said, if I get daily bread, then it sounds like God wants me to come back regular. <laughs> And I said to him, that's why God give it daily. <laughs> because God knew that if he had given you waga waga, you wouldn't come back until it's done. <laughs> but I said to him, I said to him what I now share with you. I said to him, listen friend, I understand the concept of the daily bread. He said, you understand it? I said, yes, I understand what God is doing. I said, before I have children I didn't, but now that I have picnic, me know exactly where you go. He said, how you go? He said, well, my kids, I don't give me picnic them monthly bread. Me give them every day. Every day, then come daddy, breakfast. Daddy, lunch money. Daddy, I said, I give him every day. <laughs> I said, when you're a child, you don't give children monthly bread. They get confused. And I said, as children of God, our Father in heaven said, come to daddy every day. Oh. Glory, hallelujah. I don't know where you come from, but I want you to come to daddy daily. Yes, it's good to come daily. And the bread is sure when you're in covenant with God. I mean, we should have time to Go, go, go into this daily bread business. But, 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 but I, I want to assure you because time is going to get harder and we are going to run out of food and things are going to get rough. But when it happens to you, I want you to lift up your head and look up and see if it open. Take your eyes off the candlestick and the showbread and the altar of prayer and look at the ark of covenant and see God in covenant relationship with you. Food is a, 
In fact, the whole saints understood this. That's why David could say, once I was young and now I'm an old man, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor is seed begging bread, because manna is part of the covenant. Can, can I preach a little while? <laughs> I look in the covenant. Man, so much thing in that covenant, I can't deal with everything. But let me touch that one here. Because I see Aaron's rod that budded. Part of the covenant. Did they know that? For you see, brethren, godly Christian leadership is part of the covenant. You see, I don't understand. Well, I'll explain to you. There was a day, a time, when Israel rebelled against God's leadership, Korah, Dayton, and Abiram said, Everybody is holy. <laughs> In fact, they said to Moses and Aaron, Now we don't see why we have to listen to you guys. Anybody can run God's business, everybody are passing. And we don't see you not doing anything extra when nobody else can do. And they got so mad. That they decided to stone Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron, when the people took up stones, thousands of them coming after them. Moses, is, it doesn't matter how brave you think you is. If thousands of people are coming with stones, run. <laughs> you can't reason with a mob. So Moses get to running at Aaron and Joshua. They run into the tabernacle of God, into God's sanctuary. And as they reach into the sanctuary, Suddenly, the Bible says, the Chikina glory of God that hovered in the innermost shrine between the two cherubims, that, that, that divine ball of fire but became active on behalf of God's men and the glory of God came through the curtain, phased through the curtain and out through the front door and before you know it, God run past the courtyard and God was in the midst of the congregation. God was running straight through the church and everybody that God passed dropped dead. Everybody as the glory of God passed you, you're dead. Everybody, people were dropping dead by the hundreds like wildfire and when it was happening, Moses pleaded to God. Moses said, Lord, the brethren want to kill me but please, Lord, don't kill them off. Moses said, Lord, help them. And God said to Aaron, God said, there's only one way to stop the death angel. Once the death angel starts, it must stop till everybody did. <laughs> so, they wanted to, what should I do? Here, Aaron, he said, take the censer. And he took the censer and put some of the coal from off the altar of prayer in the censer. And Ellen White writes, incidentally, that this sweet incense represents the righteousness of Christ. And I believe that, which mingles as a sweet savor with our prayers. I, I believe that and I accept it without questioning. So he took this thing, which is the righteousness of Christ. And Aaron began to run. God said, run fast. And Aaron began to run following God. God was moving. But Aaron began to run. This old man. Can you imagine a man in advanced years running? And this is the first time I have read or heard in history where a man had run against God. And God started before him. But Aaron was energized by the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, the unthinkable occurred. Aaron run left God. <laughs> the Bible said that he overtook God he just said Lord are you that and when he went in front of God he lift up the censer and I told you it represents the righteousness of Christ which mingles as a sweet savor with our prayers as it ascend towards God. And let me tell you something, not even the death angel of God can pass the righteousness of Jesus. So mighty is the blood of Jesus that Jesus can stop destruction. Will you say amen out there? So when the Lord came, realized that he can't pass Jesus because Jesus' covering is complete. Not even God can get around Jesus. When the, the death angel realized that he could not pass the censer and the priest had it in the air, high raving. The Bible said the plague ceased. 
all the people that were dying, all the rest of people who were getting sick just get better. You know, you need Jesus in your life to stop the plague from your house, you know. Did you know that? You need some Jesus in your soul. When this happens, suddenly, when the Lord realized he couldn't get over him and couldn't get around him or beneath him, the Bible said God retreated, recoiled, and went back into the holy of holies to relax. Then God said to Moses, call the leaders of the rebellion. And Moses called all the people. They came to the tabernacle of God. Then God said to them, tell everybody to put their rods on my fence and leave it. So they all come to God's house, God yard, and left it on the fence out of the door. God said, come back tomorrow and I will tell you who is going to be the leader, who is priest. Yes. The next morning when they came, Aaron's rod, that dry stick that he had been carrying, overnight, it budded and blossomed and bloomed and bore fruit. The white, sweet pomegranates all over the place and the fruits were ripe. And the stick was still dry. You know, one of the things that I have discovered is that no matter how much man try, and no matter how much we try to do it, God is the one who is choosing who is the leader, who is the preacher, and who are the pastor. You didn't know that? And you can't force God on. You can get up from your son and decide to so go to a person. You can go to NCU or some other school, study all the theology you want, and you can come back here. But if God no call you, when you get up for preach, you're dead like a doornail. <laughs> Dry as the hills of Gilboa. You get 60 degrees and it still can't help you. Because if God no call you, he no call you. <laughs> you either have it or you don't have it. But God decided that I am the one who will decide who will be leader. When they were finished, the leadership thing, God, Moses said, what should I do with this rod? God said, put it in the covenant because my people still need leadership. Will you say amen out there? And I can tell you something, that as long as you're a child of God and as long as this church is the church of God you can pray to God for good leadership and God will give it to you because leadership is part of the covenant you are the pastor to get hot just pray to God because a part of the contract <laughs> Yes, the Lord, I don't know what's happening with Pastor Clark. He's kind of dead. He needs chilling out. Lord, just touch him. Didn't you say good pastoral thing is part of the covenant? So in the last days, as things get rougher and rougher, we need to see God's presence with us. We need to recognize angels abiding with us. And we constantly have mercy as we keep the law of God. We need to recognize that God will provide for supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. We need to understand that God is committed to give us godly leadership. It's part of the covenant. You know, the covenant thing, it's so serious. I, don't think, I didn't expect to talk to you so long. But I'll tell you something. A covenant sermon like this, I can't manage it. It's just too much for me. All that I can do is share one or two things out of the covenant with you. But God, when he strikes covenant with man, God decided to put everything in his covenant. So much so, that God decided to write it down so that you can see it and read the fine prints in the covenant. Because the covenant comes with a lot of fine print. And so all Christians have a little book that they carry. It's the covenant book. It's called the new covenant and the old covenant. But it's the covenant of God. And as long as you have that, you are covered. 
Oh, glory, hallelujah. Can I tell you some things? Can I tell you some things? Clues is a part of the covenant. Ask God for good clues. Man, when they were out in the wilderness, God said to them for 40 years, you wear the same clues. And God said, your shoes didn't even wear out. Your clues didn't get old as though woven with threads of iron. Clues is a part of the covenant. Oh, I want to tell you that the covenant is comprehensive. You're the, no, no. No guardian life are such a core. Cover you like God. Yes, are you hearing me? Life. Yes, a life insurance. Yes, life is a part of the covenant. Because the covenant said, for me to live is Christ. Yes, and by the way, if you're dead, are still part of the covenant. For the Bible said, to die is gain. Will you say amen out there? <laughs> Glory, hallelujah. Read the covenant. Take the promises that are in the covenant and claim them. The old saints used to say, you name it and claim it. Look up at the covenant with God and just name it and claim it. Yes, Lord, everything that you ever need is part of the covenant. You say, will God keep it? How sure are we? That the covenant is fast. The Bible said in my text, and there were lightnings. There were what? And the voices. And what? I want you to observe something. That the covenant is so secure that God said, let me tell you what I will use to protect my covenant with you. If the enemy ever come after you, I will flash lightning. Then there are voices. I will preach the word. I will give them the word of God is against them. If they come against you, you can give them a word. And the thunderings and earthquake and great hail get in covenant. In fact, I feel like, I feel like I feel like praying for somebody. I don't know why. But like the spirit telling me somebody need prayer. Please stand where you are. Somebody need prayer. I'm not sure who. But the spirit kind of telling me that somebody here in covenant relationship with God need covenant power to be unleashed. You're here today. And you're going through rough times. And you need the power of God to move on your behalf. I'm inviting you to come to this altar. And I'll pray for you. I don't know who you are. But you're going through hard times. Yes, this is not for everybody. This is for you. Going through hardship. But you need covenant power. You need to be in covenant relationship. Yes, I came here to tell you. That our job is to look up and to see heaven open. Can I tell you that heaven is open? The way to the holiest of all is opened. Now is the time to get right with God. Yes, job is a part of the covenant too. Man, I, I have come to the conclusion that everything that we need for our survival, God put it in the covenant. Yes, family is a part of the covenant. Do you didn't know that? Yeah, God put everything. God has foreseen everything that would ever happen to you or can ever happen to you. And God made provision for it in the covenant. The problem with us is that we walk around with a contract and we're going through trouble, but we never check to see that under the policy we covered. <laughs> Oh, glory, hallelujah. Come on. I don't care what you're going through, you're covered. Covered by the Holy Ghost. Covered by the heavenly angels. Covered by Jesus Christ. Covered by God the Father. Covered by all the resources of the eternal. Ellen White writes that God cannot understand or we refuse to pray. When prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's resources, we are our treasured, the boundless resources of the eternal. Why do we refuse when we are covered? Claim it under the policy. Go to God and claim it. Name it and claim it. Claim back your children. Get your children back. Get, get your husbands back and your wives back. Get back your life. 
So the whole job gone, get a better job. It's under the covenant. <laughs> Whatever you need, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Let us pray. Oh Lord, thank you for this inspiration today. Father, help us, Lord, to recognize that we are covered by the holy policy of the eternal. What a covenant contract we have with you. Lord, you're the first insurance company who ever give me such a big book. <laughs> Covering everything that I need and giving me examples of the greatness of God and the goodness of God and the resources of the eternal. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Father, I pray for these dear ones who came forward, indicating by their walk that they are ready to claim under the policy. Oh, Lord, we know that you're more willing to give than we are to ask. Lord, you're the only insurance company who are more willing to give and to let off and to pee out. Thank you, Lord. We come, Lord, seeking financial blessing. Open the windows of heaven and pour it out. We come, Lord, seeking family reconciliation. In the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord, that you will bring our families back together. We come, Lord, seeking jobs. Lord, we ask that when one door is closed, that you will open another one. In the name of Jesus, we come, Lord, because we are sick. But, Lord, we come to you as the great physician who healed all of our diseases. In the name of Jesus today, in the name of Jesus, come down, sweet Holy Spirit. Come down, heavenly dove, a light upon us today so that we will have the assurance that we have victory in Jesus Christ. Guide us, Lord, through the rest of the Sabbath day and give us victory and help us to live in the light of the covenant, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen.